Ten states, three administrative areas, one nation, one people. Welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building a new nation. I am Adingor. This week on Fixing South Sudan, we sit down for a candid conversation with Mobir John Garang Damabir, Chairman of the Board of the NGO, the National Conversation South Sudan, and the eldest son of South Sudan's founding father and liberation icon, the late Dr. John Garang Damabir. Sir, welcome to the program. How are you? Thank you, Madin. I'm fine, thank you. The show is Fixing South Sudan. We debate pertinent issues of the nation. And I would like, in speaking to you, to go back to the epicenter of your political takeoff. Uh, you raised eyebrows in 2013 when you associated with the political movement of the then embattled first vice president, Dr. Riek Machar, who used to be seen as the main political nemesis for your father, the late SPLM, SPLA chairman and CNC. Why did you join alliances with him in 2013? Um, well, that's an interesting question. And uh, I think I can, I can it, it's important to understand history because the question is a bit based on emotions. Uh, and I understand the, those emotions. But to understand, to understand the answer to this question, we have to go to history. And when I used to be asked this question, sometimes I, uh, other journalists have asked me this question. I always answer and say that I did not join Riek Machar. Riek Machar joined me, you know, but it's difficult to understand this because if you look at 2013 or just before the crisis of 2013 happened, there was a lot of civil society groups advocating for, for reforms in the country that the country we fought for is not going the way it should be. We need, to, uh, we need some change, we need some reform, something needs to happen. And there were many voices, and uh, I remember there was a, a, peace in, a Jongule Peace Initiative with those of John Penn and like other people like uh, Comrade Carbino, who was, ended up being killed in, uh, in Jongule during that peace initiative. People like uh, Ding Chana Wall were writing, uh, advocating for change, and some of them ended up getting killed. So the, before the crisis happened, the people of South Sudan had been trying to advocate for some kind of reforms. Uh, then the crisis, as you know, began to happen where the, the, the ministers and the, the vice president and the secretary general of the SPLM were sacked. After they were sacked, then they began to associate themselves with the, the civil society that were calling for uh, reforms. The reform, this, this reform agenda was kind of hijacked by politicians. And then it was turned later into uh, a regime change agenda. So we did not join Riek Machar's regime change agenda. Uh, when the crisis broke out, peace talks began in Addis Ababa. So what we were joining was the peace talks. You understand? We were joining peace talks in Addis Ababa. Uh, the SPLMIO, uh, which is Riek Machar is the leader, was formed in April. And the negotiations in Addis Ababa started in January. You see, so our joining was joining a peace process to find a solution to the crisis that had come into the country. And we felt like we had the faculties to be able to contribute uh, to a solution. And so the only space that was available for young people like ourselves was the, was the, the site that became known as the SPLMIO under Dr. Riek Machar. And I can tell you today that when we went to Nasser in April, to endorse uh, this whole uh, I.O. business. Had an election been held in Nasser, I would have defeated Riek Machar, you know. But of course, because of social muscle and, and, and politics of elders and young people in South Sudan, 
like it ended up going that way. But had, it been, had there been a democratic election, I would have uh, won in Nasser. Let me go back to the political context of 2013. Riyadh Machar and a number of politicians were talking about reforms. Before it, it became conflict, it was reforms within the ruling party. You are saying that you were also advocating for reforms and you found yourself in the same bandwagon. That's what you mean by Riyadh Machar joining you. What I mean, what I mean by Riyadh Machar joining me is that Riyadh Machar was in the government and we were outside the government advocating for reforms. He only started calling for these reforms when they got sacked. You know, after they got sacked, then like uh, what became known as the G10 went and recruited Riyadh Machar to be part of them and they decided to use their positions as members of the SPLM and Riyadh Machar's position as the deputy chair of the SPLM uh, because they had been sacked from their positions in the cabinet. You understand? Formerly, you joined forces and like I asked, that raised eyebrows for many who never thought it was possible for the son of Dr. John Garang to work together with Riyadh Machar. Did that surprise you and how did you take that? Well, no, it didn't surprise me at all. And even for me, myself, it took time for me to be able to, to come to such a decision. Like, uh, in, if it was in 2005, 2006, up to 2007, I could have never imagined myself being in the camp of Riyadh Machar. And I understand the animosities that, uh, why it would raise eyebrows, you understand? But as time went by and uh, we were seeing the, how the crisis and things were going in the country, uh, we saw that, per somebody like me personally, saw that uh, joining Riyadh Machar would be actually something revolutionary to do. And I would have hoped, you know, but because I think I underestimated the, the amount of animosity towards the, per, the, the person of Riyadh Machar. You know, but what's best for our country would be, for example, for, for a genuine reconciliation of our people. You know, and so maybe by joining the camp of Riyadh Machar, maybe it will, it will, it will change, like a, it, will, it will be a unifying factor to bring the people of South Sudan back together again. The fight was largely uh, taking tribal lines and people thought that you joined the other side against your own people. The popular expectation, the expectation was that you belong solidly in the camp of Salfa Kir Mayadi. Yeah, because of the tribal element of that. But, yes. I'm, but I'm not a tribal person, okay. you see. So I was, I'm able to see the bigger picture. But you, you see the bigger picture while also understanding you know, the, local, the local sentiments and feelings. Were you oblivious of the history? Why you not? thought that you could just brush aside history for political Expediency. No, it wasn't for political expediency. It was for the people of South Sudan's unity, you know, because what will, the, what will be the future of South Sudan if we continue on the path that we are on right now, you know? So it was actually social suicide, you know? I, I was committing class suicide, you know? It was a sacrifice on my side, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that the people also didn't see it that way. Can you convince uh, those who have been talking in the region, not understanding why the son of the founding father would leave and join the leader of the opposition? Can you make them understand? Yeah, but that's what I told you, that the leader of the opposition joined me. I did not join the leader of the opposition. That is your version. And that and and the feeling is that you started working together and you are saying that your issues at the time were one and the same. We had coincide, we, our, our interests coincided when he was for the reform agenda. When he was no longer for the reform agenda, so I, I, the, it was not like we joined Riek Machar because he has broad shoulders or because he has a beautiful smile. It's not because we loved him personally. It was based on interest. And when our interests coincided and he claimed that he was for reforms, we went there. Young people in South Sudan, there was no space for young people. And you know, like the, the, the system is a, is a gerontocratic system where the old people are, have, have sat on the necks of the young people. There's no space, you know, uh, for, for young people. To, in, you know. So the only place where there was a space was in the opposition. 
And I took that gamble and made the social suicide to be able to further the agenda of peace in the country. And that was the only way I could have, I could have done it. There was no other way. And today, those who were talking and who had all that animosity, today they are not, they are, like if you look at the social media in 2013, they, they, they're not, sub, not only subsided, 180, it's a, it's a 180 turn, you know, and so I think that... Uh, you have won. No, I don't, I don't want to say I've won, but uh, I made my point, you know. I think I've made my point, and uh, I left, I left, I left Riyag Machar uh, because he was no longer, he was, you know, and we had been warned, you know, many people had warned us. I think the sentiments and the feelings are not as important to me. But people did warn me about Riyad Machar and that he's like this, he's like this, and he abandons people and this and this and this. But I could not, based on people's feelings, based on gossip, I, wit I had to witness for, for my own self. Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor, and with us in the program is Mobile John Garang de Mobile, chairman of the board of the non-governmental organization, the National Conversation South Sudan, and the eldest son of South Sudan's founding father and liberation icon, the late Dr. John Garang de Mabiul. And we are speaking about his life. And I just asked you about what prompted you to be on the camp of Dr. Riak, which you explained. And I'm going logically, after the signing of the RCS in 2015, first Vice President Riek Machar made you a full-fledged minister in recognition of your active support to the SPLM, SPLIO. Was being a minister a vindication of your political gamble, as you describe it? Uh, no, but uh, I want to go back. Uh, to the Riek Machar, there's one, the, the, with, the, with the president, you know, like there was, like recently we had a handshake. Which we will come to that. Which was witnessed. We are going it's, back it's, to his, we are connected. going back to history. But it is connected. And in history, you were made a minister and people said, maybe that's what Mabior Garang was fighting for. Was that a vindication for you? That you were recognized? For your efforts? No, because I wasn't recognized for my efforts. What did you make of being made a minister, I which is advantage. a major step? I took full advantage of it because I knew actually it wasn't going to do anything. Like if I was to get into the ministry and use the ministry itself to do what I wanted to do, nothing was going to happen because it was uh, the peace process was not honest and there was mistrust between the parties. And so like the, the, the peace was not real. And we were aware of this, and we were aware that war can break out any time. But knowing the culture of people of South Sudan, how what we call wazifa in the local vernacular position mm, is, is so highly respected in South Sudan, you know, that when I was made a minister, you, you will not believe it, how my life changed. Just the, the 70 days that I was a minister. Every, people should try being a minister. It's very amazing. Are you saying that it wasn't significant and that... It was significant in that it rose my profile. It rose up my profile for me now to be able to be heard, you know, uh, other things. So like the ministry position itself, had I just taken that alone, would have done nothing. But it gave me a platform for people of South Sudan to now say, oh, Kachia Abany, or he has become a, a, a leader. He's now respectable because of just by virtue of just having been given a position and it happens to many people today if you're appointed and like it's announced on SSBC that Madingo became a, a minister your life will change overnight and if you're fired the day you're fired your life changes and goes back to did you feel that the appointment was deserved and that as I asked was a vindication no. for you no I just took people it as people never thought that you knew what you were doing and that you were just... The vindication was not the position. The vindication was being heard by people of South Sudan, you know? Not the position per se. The position was a, was a, was a stepping, you know, was like a, a platform, a tool. It was not the, the actual 
what made people of South Sudan respect me. It was now when they were able to hear, like, because before they were, like, they, what they knew were the rumors that this guy, you know, drug addict, he's, he's the drunkard. Like, that's all, that was, what, that was my image. But now when I became a minister, people were like, okay, let's see what he will do. And then when they started hearing me, they were like, oh, you see. So the vindication was not the position alone. And how was your interaction uh, with the people when you became minister? I just used, the, I, I did not look at it as a, as, as, a, as a big thing. I just looked at it as another tool in, in, my, in my arsenal of, of, of contributing to the work of people of South Sudan. You know, and that is why I did not, when, when, the, when the war broke out in 2016, I could have stayed as a minister, you know, but I decided that no, like just to be a minister for the sake of being a minister, I, I can, I, I, that's not what I, why I accepted the position. I accepted the position because I could be able to use the position to further my other things that I, that, that I want to do. You are actually making a very interesting point because after the J1 uh, dogfight, you opted once more to follow Riyad Machar to what the Genovin called the Bush. And instead of striking a deal with the successive first vice president, General Taban Deng, who was friendly to you, why was this? The I think it was a mistake. I can, I can say it was a mistake. And I, I've actually said that Taban Denga is owed, is owed an apology, you know, by, by Riek Machar and the SPLMIO, you know, because he tried to actually salvage the situation in 2016. But uh, there was a bit of bravado and machismo within the IO, you know, and felt that they could take Juba maybe or something like that. But had we listened to Taban Denga, it would be, we might have been in a different place. Uh, today. You should have stayed. Uh, not necessarily. You should have stayed and that would have, that would have secured you a ministry. No, I could have, if I had stayed, I would not have I, would have, I would have stayed as a private citizen. Like I should have stayed, yes. But I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to stay and be a minister in that government. You know, because of the, the, the manner in which the 2016 dogfight happened and all that. I would not have been comfortable continuing being in government, but it was a mistake to leave again, you know, I could have stayed, nothing would have, uh, there was nothing chasing me really. Why did you decide to leave Juba and you went out once more when you had the opportunity to continue on as a minister? Yeah, like the, minis the ministerial position was not, like I said, it was not what I actually wanted because there's nothing I could have done as a minister. I could have done things outside of being a minister, not only as a minister. So I was not there for being a minister. I was not there for position. As you can, rem if you remember, I went, I joined the I IO as a captain in the army. And I came back and I'm sitting here today with you as a captain in the army. So my motivation always has never been uh, that I want this position or I want, you know, it has always been to further the goal of liberation. You know, uh, we are an organization, a, a civil society organization, and when <clears throat> we, are, we are continuing the liberation struggle, uh, that we, like, as you know, the liberation struggle, the history of the liberation struggle, there's the SPLA and the SPLM. But what many people don't talk about is the civil authorities of New Sudan, which was the civil society wing of the, of the movement, you know, and so, our, our, our work started from before the, the, the independence of South Sudan uh, for the liberation of our people. The independence of South Sudan does not equal to the liberation of the people. Your motivations have never been about to acquire power. No, uh, no, 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 no. Power is dynamic, you know. So legitimate power, which is the seat of government, you know, is not... You, know, you did not rebel not want. because you wanted power. No. You wanted change. I wanted change, and you need power to, to, to make change. But it's important to understand power itself, because our people don't understand power, you know, and... That, that is another conversation altogether. I, I, think, I think it is. It's a lot, and... Why don't we take another break? In our series 
on fixing the land debate, which commenced last week, will be hosting all kinds of South Sudanese and others to present solutions to land-based conflicts. It is stated clearly that land belongs to the communities, but also regulated by the government. The land belongs to the people. We don't end there, but it has to be regulated. Who regulates it is the state. The problem which our people have is that they thought that the land belonged to the community. Yes, the land belonged to community, but regulated by the government. And who is that government? It is the local authority which is near them, and also the government which is heading that state, and the government of the Republic of South Sudan. You don't say, you know, I'm the commander of this area, so I have the right to distribute this area, or I'm the chief, this is my area, and uh, even there are some chiefs now who sell land to foreigners. We have managed to now to reduce this land grabbing. I, if I, I'm not saying that is not uh, continuing, but to, to, to the extent, 80 percent, 80 percent, no more uh, grabbing uh, that is happening now. In, in South Sudan, we are not supposed to have a land grabbing. We are supposed to have the settlement, because we, people want to settle. That is the, the, the correct answer. But saying that the land has been grabbed, the land is being grabbed from the country to the country. But being a people in one country, you cannot grab the land. This is Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor, and with us in the program, Mabior John Gareng, the Mabior, the chairman of the board and principal moderator of National Conversation South Sudan. We come back for the final round. When the RRCs were signed in 2018, you were nominated to serve as Deputy Minister of Interior. You chose to turn it down. Why was this the case? Uh, it's because uh, I wrote it in my, I wrote it in my <coughs> resignation that I felt like we were being set up to fail. Uh, the agreement was not negotiated in good faith, you know, and security arrangements were not negotiated in good faith, and the agreement was going to fail, you know. It was, it was clear that the agreement was going to fail because security arrangements were not prioritized. And by the time that the government was formed uh, in 2020, I believe, the, there had been a lot, uh, two extensions or three, and like, you know, people were wrestling until the government was finally formed without security arrangements. But if you read the agreement, by the time I take up my docket as a Deputy Minister of Interior, the pre-transitional period should have taken care of certain security issues in the country, you know, and those things were not, had not been done. And intercommunal violence was rampant in the country and all kinds of different insecurities. And the, the mentality of people of South Sudan is that it's as if you come from your house, from your, if you dole up, if you bet in your house, and you come and, and, and do things in the ministry. They don't understand that the ministry has uh, uh, mass development master plans, and like you don't come and do your own thing, you know. So the intercommunal violence that was continuing despite the peace, uh, people saying give peace a chance, and intercommunal violence is still going on. It could have been a very easily blamed that Mobiori is not the one is, is it has failed to provide security. When the reality is that the security arrangements have not been implemented. Then now when you are appointed, people say, oh Mobiori, congratulations. Now you go and fix the security. That's and not how it works. To go and try. That's to succeed works, or even fail. That is not how it works. It doesn't work like that. How am I going to do the work that was supposed to be done by the security, uh, by, by the security arrangements, chapter two? You know, chapter two of the agreement should have been implemented before like, I, I take up certain things, like Juba should have been demilitarized. There are certain, how am I the one now, just as a deputy minister of interior, and then with the, with the name and with the enemies that I have, it can be very easily made into propaganda. And that the, minister, the minister himself will not be the one who will be blamed. They will come and blame the deputy minister because I'm a soft target. Is a political opportunity for
for you to try your best. It doesn't mean that if you don't succeed, mm -hmm. that the blame rests with you squarely. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that because I don't come from my house with different things. You know, like the Minister of Health doesn't come from their house with the medicines. You know, that if we will change this Minister of Health, maybe the other Minister of Health will come with something different from their house. The ministries have a development master plan that, are supposed, that they are supposed to follow. Isn't that political idealism that you want things to be set right before you can come in? No, it's not really political idealism, but there are certain, pre certain prerequisites sometimes that are necessary. You know, because of course there's no agreement which is, which is perfect. All the other chapters uh, could have been left out. Everything could have been left out. And chapter two only, a few of the things implemented and we would have had peace. In 2015, you were made, Riyak Machar made you minister. In 2018, he made you deputy minister. What happened? And is that part of your frustration? He made me. How did he make me? you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, what, how, how, how would that be my frustration? Because like, I got the nomination. You are demoted. Well, Your juniors were promoted, well, such as others that I will not name. Is that a part of, a legitimate part of your frustration? It is not, but like, uh, I can say that uh, you can't ignore human feelings. So human feelings are there, you know, like, I'm, I'm not made out of wood, you know. So, but that, that, that is not like the biggest uh, problem because I was not the only one who was who, who was victimized there were very very many people uh, in the IO and, and this is what made the IO uh, collapse in the end but yeah like you could like that it's it's a small part of it you know human feelings are always a, a, a factor in any equation and you ignore them at your own at your own risk you understand so you never took up the job and in the end, it was given to someone else. After how long? After a long time. <laughs> yeah. And do you think that is justified? Is what justified? That it is justified that you fought uh, in the political battlefield, and in the end, you ended up with nothing. Well, it's the decision. What was now your end game? It was the decision. You said that your motivation was not position, and now. You were now opting to be on the outside as a private citizen. Did that nullify no. the main reason why you went to the bush in the no. first place? No, because, because we, the, I have been heard now. You understand? Because there's, there's this idea in the I.O. camp that had it not been Riek Machar, Riek Machar made you. If it wasn't Riek Machar, you, you know? But at the same time, there's an element of your own uh, knowledge and understanding. You know, so the being in the I.O. made me be heard, you understand, and gave me a certain profile in the eyes of people. And now, if the I.O. Does, felt like they don't need me anymore, you know, I can't force them, I can't impose myself on them, you know, and still my objective is to help people of South Sudan. Helping people of South Sudan doesn't need Riek Machar to appoint you to be anything. And if there were some conspiracies within the I.O. that made people decide that they want to push me out of the I.O. Like, I can't do anything about that. But they can't stop my contributing to uh, the socio-economic development of our country. Even when you were nominated as deputy minister and it was not rescinded, you continued to be critical of the SPLM I.O. decision to come to Juba. And in other words, there are times when you have described it as a surrender because the prerequisites should have been done first before they came. Yeah, we surrendered. You sur the SPLM I was surrendered. We surrendered. And you were vocal about that. Yes. At what point did you break with the SPLM I formally, and why? Uh, it was a funny situation that is difficult to describe because there was a, a, res a fake resignation letter that was circulating in social media for almost one year. Uh, and there was, at the end of the one year, Riek Machar ended up uh, writing a letter uh, acknowledging, accepting that resignation, which had been clearly 
established as a fake. You had debunked it. It, has, it had been established as a fake for one year. You had personally debunked yes. it. Yes. And for an entire year, that paper was there as a, as a fake. When the Kitguang Declaration uh, happened... Before the Kitguang, that was the, the fake resignation letter... When the Kitguang Declaration happened, then he accepted, you know, because he felt like maybe this guy might join Kitguang. You know, we have victimized this guy at the end and we humiliated him. So maybe he will join Kitguang. Now the, he, he, he began to think about human feelings, you know. When they were doing that thing that they did, they were not thinking about human feelings. But now when Kitguang came up, they felt like, ah, this guy, he's a strong guy. If he joins Kitguang, Kitguang might be strong. So let us accept the resignation to do some propaganda on his name so that, you know, the, the I.O. constituency can be like, ah, Mabior has, has joined the government or, or like his own propaganda to, 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 to discredit me. You understand? But it was a panic. It was a panic in the last minutes when he was being deposed. When he wrongly accepted uh, your resignation, did you try uh, to clarify? No, I was very angry. I was actually very angry. And that is, that is you, could, you could say that you asked, like I was, even I didn't know how to answer the, the question you asked about wh at what point. That was the point. When Riek Machar accepted a letter he knows that is fake is the point where I broke with the, with the SPLM IO. And, and then you started to talk positively about Kid Guang. What was your opinion about Kid Guang? Well, Kid Guang is, a, is SPLM IO. You know, they are one and the same. And so Kid Guang has been taken as if it's an organization in itself. But Kid Guang is a village in, up, in, in, in Greater Upper Nile in which the declaration was made you know, by a part of the SPLM IO. So it was a split in the movement, you know, and because of all this mismanagement in the IO management by crisis and the abandonment of, like I said, Riek Machar joined us, you know, when he lost his vice presidency position. When he got back his vice presidency position, he abandoned us and went back. You agreed with the principles of Kid Guam, so, but in the end, you did not associate with them. Yeah, because, because, because I had already left IO. I was no longer in IO, but the enemy of your enemy is your friend, you know. And if you can, if if we could help uh, the case of the of the of the kit, of the group of Kitguang IO be heard, then I think we would be like it it, it, it would it, we would be happy about that, you know. And Kitguang declaration, the SPLM IO Kitguang group deposed the politicians, you know. So in a way, I was agreeing with my deposition. From, you know, uh, from I.O. But you were never a member of Kid Guang. No, I was never a member of Kid Guang because Kid Guang is a military organization, you know, and they deposed the politicians. But we felt like we, their, their case is genuine and we need to help them because it destroys Riek Machar's camp and we are against Riek Machar now. And in recent days, you have been talking against the camp of Riek Machar or there's been a war between the two camps NCSS. I wouldn't. I, we have to. We have to divide the camp of Riek Machar because it's not one. And you are saying that they are part and parcel of the failure that is happening, that the, the non-implementation of the security arrangements, they also are to blame. You have been articulating. That. Yeah, yeah, they are. And uh, like I'm saying, there are there are different. I want to be clear because I don't want to lump all members in the SPLMIO into some negative thing because I have many comrades and colleagues who remained in the SPLMIO who are genuine, who, who want change and want the best for our country. They, they, the, the security arrangements, like I was saying before, were not negotiated in good faith, you know, and this has prolonged the, the implementation of the, of, of the peace. Um, it's like, uh, and the SPLM IO is partially to blame because of what? Because they are accepted to come they before accepted, they accepted to come to Juba before the arrangements were made. They they accepted to come to Juba before the arrangements were made, and they have also done nothing for their forces in in the cantonment areas. There's also like the issue of the security arrangements not being negotiated in good faith. Because let's say if we want to have a unified army, how can we 
train a, an army in eight months. You know, uh, there are certain basic military drills and, you know, which can take three months. But for you to graduate a national army within eight months, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult. You know, you need at least a year, at least a year. Three years is preferable. So like we, if, if we had a security arrangement of five years, then it would be more honest. You know, but if you're saying security arrangement should take eight months, then it's a hidden, it's a, it's a regime change in disguise. You know, and no genuine uh, legitimate power, somebody with legitimate power, would implement themselves out of power just like, you know, like, okay, here, you sign something and it is Baba, here, take it. it. It has never happened anywhere in the world, you know, and so there's some naivety, you know, politically in the IO where I think this naivety has caused a lot of uh, problems in South Sudan. And let me wrap up this interview by not only defining you about your past association, but also the present association. In recent months, you, are meeting, you have been meeting with the President of the Republic of South Sudan, General Salfa Kiir Mayadid, someone who is not strange to you. And some people have described it as a handshake. Uh, to liken it with what has happened between Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, ODM uh, leader with uh, Raila Odinga, who is the leader of the opposition. What would you say about your meeting with the president? It was a good meeting. Uh, I, I've, I've, it, it was, I don't want to say historical, but it was moving. You know, it was moving for me. Uh, I have not, I had, I, until that time, I had not really had uh, good interactions with the president and be able to meet him and those kind of things. And maybe that's what created a distance between us. Maybe there were people who created that distance. But then we've, we've been apart from, for a very long time. And when I, when I interacted with him, it was, uh, it, was, it was familiar, you know, it was more like a family kind of affair, you know, and so... I was very moved and, and touched. Uh, it's a, he, he, we've never, we've never had that kind of relationship since my father died, you know. So when he called for me, I can, I can say, I can say that I had, I had, uh, I had, I don't know how to say in English, but in our, in our mother tongue, we say, you know, I had, uh, I had left, you know, I had gone because I felt like I was being mistreated in South Sudan, treated the way that I don't deserve to be treated. And not listened. And my uncle is there, Salfakir, who was with my father all this time. So I felt frustrated in a way, you know, that people could come in and spoil our relationship and what. So I had left South Sudan and in our cultures, when you, when you move out, you abandon your home, because of mistreatment by your, by your kinsmen. You leave, you know, and if your kinsmen love you, they send somebody to go and look for you, like, our oh, brother, why did, you, why did you leave home, you know, come back? And that's what he did. And so when he called for me to come back, many uncles could have done that, you know, like there was, I'm sure you've heard about the wars in our own uh, community where the, the person who brought, who the president sent to go and bring me uh, to come and meet him is being condemned by the community that why is it that guy who went and came with Mabir? But none of them thought about it. None of these el so-called elders of mine thought about coming to ask me about what is, what, is, what is wrong, you know? And so this is why I say I was very touched when President Salfa called for me and I, I could not refuse I could. Add, I, I. I said, let me at least go and hear what he has to say. And if I. And if we don't. What is the outcome of your talk? Are you going to join the government? Has he offered a position? Am, am I going to join the government? Has he offered you a formal position? No. I mean, there was there was something discussed, uh, but uh, it is not. Uh, Nothing is finalized. No, nothing is finalized. And I don't want anything even, you know, because it was a tricky situation. Because when I came, the, it was more for, the, for opening a new page with the president and being able to 
come to Juba and national conversation be able to do its activities. And we had that handshake. I was sick, he also uh, offered me uh, treatment for me to go and get treated. And so it's like... Uh, After now, you have not joined the SPLM IG, formally. That's mischief. You are a principal to tell me to moderator SPLM, to tell of NCSS. Tell me to join SPLM IG is mischief. You have not made an announcement. It's mischief. The president was going to, like, I didn't ask for anything, you know. But the president, I heard from the people who he sent that the president wants to do something uh, for me. And uh, if I say no, then it looks like you're refusing what the president is saying, you know. But like I don't want. But like the reason I'm I'm saying that uh, your your this is mischief to tell me to join SPLM is mischief. Is I don't understand. I don't understand how I will join SP, SPLM. We left board in 1983, you know. Like we are like we were there with the founders as the, as little children. But you had agreed with the mainstream wing, so you just came back. No, no, no. Because this is this is this is part of what we even discussed with President Salva Kiir. And even when I met with uh, those of uh, Ankola Wendit and Kual Manyang, we talked about some of these things. And like these are some of the things that have been making our movement quarrel since day one, since 1983. And th the question of, is it SPLA, SPLM, or is it SPLM, SPLA? You understand? And we are more in the camp of SPLA, SPLM. For us, the movement is the SPLA. If you listen to the old war songs of the, of the liberation struggle, Akuma das PLA, Kobukum. It was never as Kuma das PLM, Akobukum. SPLA, give birth nobody, to the SPLA. Nobody, nobody. It was a stillbirth, or it's like a, it's a child which is Kinwe, like a child which is malnourished. malnourished, you know, because the SPLA was the movement, and the movement was going to create the conditions for which the SPLM should be, would, would, have, would have come about. The SPLM. Was, 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 was a place where people who could potentially demobilize people in the villages. Because you will come with your PhD from London or you will come with your PhD from D Washington, D.C. to join the movement which has become popular. Then you will come and you will say, what will you people give me? And then when you don't get what you feel like, you're sati like you should get... You don't formally join the you, SPLM. You, you, will go to, you will go to the not only not formally join the SPLA, you will go to the Hill Lazatu, you will go to your, your village, you will go to your village and you will start demobilizing people that this is the government of Yenge or this is the government of, you know, and say that I don't want this, we, like we know these people should not come here, yeah. you know, but like you can say that SPLM can mahal barakanufogu siyasi because the real work was for shooting the bullets, you know, and the SPLM had all kind of people who did not want to fight, did not want to be part of them. Are you saying you have never left the SPLM? So you should no, 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 like, no. Like, understand what I'm saying. Kind of. I'm kind of saying that. I'm kind of saying that. But more specific than that, I'm saying I'm SPLA, I'm not SPLM. You see? You are a revolutionary. I am SPLA, and the, 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 I told this to the president, and I told it to those of uh, Kualdi, that we, we missed a step. In the transition, you know, when we were to transition from the movement, an armed liberation movement, to, uh, to a political party, we missed a step because the cadres of the movement who know the ideology of the movement were armed militants. They were soldiers in the bush. Like, even if you were a political commissar, you were a soldier, you know. Now, when we get independence, those people become the national army. And, the, a long talk about and their hands are tied. What the SPLM has turned into. But as we speak, you are still the principal moderator of National Conversation which South Sudan. Roots. Which has its roots in the civil authorities of New Sudan. That's where we were born in 1997. You are continuing the struggle. Yes, we are continuing the struggle of the people's movement. The and people's is, is movement. that part of any change, any sea change in the lives of the everyday people of Sassari. We will do what we can together with the people. You know, it's like we are not, we are not uh, the white savior. Like, we don't have the white savior mentality, you know. Even us, we need, like, all of us here as young people, 
we are in, kind of in the same boat, whether you're in, in Amura, in, in, in the villages over there, or whether you're in anywhere in the torch or anywhere, or sitting here in the hotels, we are not, we, we don't have, there's a certain level of financial uh, freedom that young people don't have, you know, so this is, the, this is the next struggle, you know, for our economic liberation as young people, you know, uh, power struggles, you know, of the old people to use young people to fight for them is what we are fighting against to try and make young people know that we need to come together to, to, to learn, to teach uh, ourselves and to leave for the next generation the modern techniques of wealth creation. Mabir John Garang, thanks for coming to Fixing Sasa. Thank you, Madin Noir.